Welcome to another episode of Cannabis Health Radio. I'm Ian Jessup. And I'm Corey Elland. The Healing Church is a cannabis church that freely promotes the use of cannabis. And joining us from Rhode Island to tell us about the Healing Church is Alan Gordon. Alan, thanks very much for doing this. Hi, Ian. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, most of our listeners around the world probably never heard of the Healing Church. Can you give us some background of who you are and what you do, etc.? Well, our church is headed by Reverend Dr. Ann Armstrong, and we're biblical originalists, so we take very seriously this cannibalism, as it says in Hebrew in the Bible, as the source of the aroma soothing to the Lord that ended war and disease, and in fact, the whole Bible centered around that plant. We're pretty sure it's cannabis. Uh, we, we document church art from before Prohibition showing it as cannabis uh, all over the world. In particular, we're interested in telling your audience about is that um, we've found some ways that with prayer, um, it's really a type of placebism. We've figured out a way to enhance or accelerate cannabis's awesome healing properties by sort of reconnecting it to this ancient ritual use of it that people of all cultures, not just Christianity, um, used to use on a regular basis, our, our Hindu brothers and sisters and, and all over the world. And so I want to teach people how to enhance cannabis's healing properties uh, with the prayer of their choice. Even atheists can do it to some degree. Okay, can you take us through that? How does that work? I'll start at the beginning the best I can. There was an Italian study back, in, I think, in the 90s or the early 2000s that showed that while cannabis has awesome healing properties, we're all familiar with them. We've seen the, what look like miracles with epilepsy and, and autism and cancer, obviously. Um, those work on mice who don't have any sense of placebism. But what was also noted that cannabis boosts placebism, which is this strange process whereby the human mind, if it believes in a medicine as efficacious, boosts its effectiveness through some sort of willpower, or we don't really understand how it works. But what this Italian study found is that process in the human body that we've known about for decades, it works with a sugar pill if you tell someone that's a medicine, that the, the placebism of our neurology is tied inextricably to the cannabinoid receptor, such that um, cannabis not only has awesome healing properties as if mechanical, like it would on a mouse that doesn't have placebism, it also boosts itself in any other treatments that a person's using by enhancing placebism. So no wonder we find it at the basis of Hinduism and at the earliest writings of the Judeo-Christian scriptures. It's tied into the way we believe and in a way that accelerates healing. Um, on the ground, what we see is just absolutely stunning results with cannabis medicines, accelerations where a little drop of a dilute biblical cannabis oil recipe, this it's anointing oil following the biblical recipe, as it's called an unflourage. It's not a concentrate by any means, but we're putting a drop of it at the edge of somebody's cast when they've got a crushed limb awaiting surgery to put pins in, and then they'll get their scan right before surgery, and the doctor will say, these bones have set themselves and healed and begun to knit with an acceleration that I've never seen before. We can't do the surgery as we planned because it's healed too quickly. Um, and well, and we've seen that on repeated occasions. Um, we had a stage B pancreatic cancer patient recently, and you could heal that patient with just straight cannabis concentrate. But we also prayed with this fellow because he's been a member of the Catholic Church in earnest for some 30 years. He's just deeply involved, and he believes in biblical cannabis oil. And as a Catholic, he understands that you can't just give up on a cancer without trying. You know, the Catholics are pro-life, so you're not allowed to just die. So you have to try cannabis. It's kind of like a religious obligation if you're a true Catholic. The, their law says you have to try and save your life. Well, you can't just die without trying cannabis oil. It works. So um, he started cannabis oil. And they opened him up because he was unwell, and they saw a tumor on his pancreas that had shown signs of beginning to metastasize. Well, that's it, usually. They told him to prepare, prepare your affairs and say goodbye, and your family will run a chemo on you, but it won't work. And he started this cannabis oil treatment, and biblical cannabis oil and prayer with the best attitude in the world, just the most positive attitude. And his cancer markers went from 17,000 to 29,000 to 00070 to zero. 
and the back three weeks of it with the stunning results were the three weeks he was using cannabis oil, like that fast, a cancer considered just absolutely lethal that nobody gets better from. And we just see these stunning results time after time, um, bringing people out of a seizure with just a touch of dilute anointing oil on their forehead in a prayer in front of stunned witnesses. You know, Alan, when you talk about the placebo effect, I read a study that was done a number of years ago of people who had knee injuries. And they took a control group, and all they did was just make a cut in the knee as though they performed surgery on it. And the other group, they actually did an operation on the knee. The group that did not have the surgery, that just had the little cut, they were told that their knee is fine, and they believed it. And they actually were healed, I guess, is the incorrect word, but they were, they were, their problem was dealt with. And so it, what that tells us is that the human mind has tremendous power that we're only beginning to understand today. What are your thoughts? Uh, that's absolutely correct, and whatever placebo benefit was shown in that knee surgery experiment would have been dramatically enhanced with cannabis added to it, which incidentally would have helped whatever knee problem they were suffering, even without placebism. And the tremendous potential for placebo healing in the human mind is inextricably intertwined with the cannabinoid receptor system. And you can do miraculous things with it without cannabis using endocannabinoids, but that's just a tip of the iceberg as to what's really what that thing is really meant to do. And in terms of the ability to believe in the efficacy of a treatment, um, the treatment's past history is, is helpful for a patient. They're like, oh, this treatment has worked on other people. I believe in it. Or the um, doctor's bedside manner or vast experience. And we're finding that when people learn that prayer can accelerate the healing power of cannabis or any medicine, but especially cannabis, and that prayer is in the Bible and cannabis prayer is in the Bible for that purpose, we find that it's really easy for people to believe in it. I mean, some people do healing prayers with their just their endocannabinoid system. If they're in really good health and they're eating good fats, they can do good things with it. But it's a heck of a lot easier to believe, excuse me, a heck of a lot easier to believe in the prayer of the type that's in the Bible when all of a sudden you realize that cannabis is interwoven all through that biblical verse, if you're looking at it, its original languages, and that, oh, that's what that healing's all about. Before Prohibition started, all Catholic and Episcopal churches in their Bible art, their stained glass, their fresco, and their sculpture showed cannabis in their Bible story art, and it was just a humble hemp plant, the tops of which were used by midwives to ease labor pains, and women of which knew how to make into edible medicines, but it wasn't this big to do because there was no money in it. Um, but when Prohibition started, they stopped putting that church on it. You can still see it in any old church from before about 1915, but what we also find is these old churches, if you check with very old people that used to attend them or if they've got good records, um, there was a healing wave from about 1880 to about 1915 where people were coming in, taking communion, praying and leaving their crutches and canes and walkers behind at the church. And some of these churches still store rooms full of these old antique walkers and canes and crutches. And that's because they used to actually have cannabis, hashish, concentrated resins, in the communion. They dissolved some in the wine, it was in the wafer, and they would make the aroma soothing to the Lord. Uh, as recently as 1914, excuse me, 1904, a pope was coronated at the Vatican while well, billowing cannabis smoke was made before him, and every time it went out, the people would cry, help us, Holy Father, the glory of the world has been extinguished, and then they would light the cannabis again. And this was just accepted ritual. Nobody made a big deal out of it. Alan, when you talk um, about the biblical recipe, how different is the biblical recipe to some of the recipes that are used today for cannabis? Today, the hardcore healings that we see from cancers, are done with extracts, highly potent extracts. Um, the extracts existed and are referenced and are even used ritually in the Bible, but the bulk of the ritual use of cannabis is in the Bible was to take that extract and dissolve it into what's called an enfleurage with olive oil and some other spices. And that was heated at low temperature and vaporized in vast quantities to just keep this cannabis steam in the air at the temperature. 
and over the altar. And it was called the aroma soothing to the Lord. The Bible says to make it morning and evening and all night long. The anointing oil was psychoactive. If you put it all over your head, we see in Isaiah 61, 1, it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because I am anointed. Or when King David was anointed at first Kings 16, 13, it's, uh, he says, they anointed him and the spirit of the Lord came upon him. But we also see smoking of hashish in the Bible, where in Isaiah 6, an angel comes and holds a coal up to Isaiah's lips and purifies him. If I was a member of your church and went to one of your services, what would be involved? We um, anoint the sick. We will anoint people who aren't sick, who ask for it, or we'll let them anoint themselves. We smoke cannabis and cannabis resins. And in particular, we blow smoke through ram's horn trumpets. Uh, it says in the book of Nehemiah 4.20, chapter 4, verse 20, that whoever comes to the sound of that horn will receive divine assistance. And to us, that story about um, where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac to make the aroma soothing to the Lord because he didn't have an animal that could. And then the angel showed him a ram trapped by its horns in a thicket. We found stained glass depictions in many churches showing that as a cannabis thicket and a stone ram. And lo and behold, when they cut the fatty tissues out of the ram and threw it on the altar fire, it made the aroma soothing to the Lord. Well, it's because the, the ram had been grazing on cannabis. So by blowing cannabis smoke through that horn ceremonially, we invoke that and we mean to end child sacrifice. We're pro-life. Don't yell at us. We know a lot of cannabis people are liberal. We don't judge other people. If somebody is considering having an abortion, it's because we haven't provided them enough choices to, to keep their baby. Nobody wants to have an abortion. I mean, but we're very strongly pro-life. We're, we're Catholic, but we're not Roman Catholic. We're, um, we're the trunk. We're Hebrew Catholic. Roman Catholic is a branch like Eastern Orthodox or African Orthodox, and we're the trunk. The Bible depicts a hereditary line of heavy cannabis users. And that trait, that hereditary trait that the Bible depicts is passed from the mother, not paternally. And our leader, Reverend Ann, she has that trait. I have the trait, but I'm a stub. I can't pass it. I'm a man. In the Hebrew faith, religion or faith passes from the mother, and that's why. Jesus was anointed by a woman, Mary Magdalene. She was of that line. The Bible's first deacon was a woman, even though the Roman Catholic Church says they can't ordain deaconesses. The Bible's first deacon was a woman, St. Phoebe. She anointed Paul. So it's described in the Bible. Mary, obviously, was another one. Um, but we take this very seriously. We pray at a, a, a sacred well that we found in Providence, which we say is prophesied in the book of Revelation, where the tree of life is to be given back to us in Revelation 22.2. It says it's a sacred well in a city of God. We're like, oh, Providence, the well where religious freedom was established for the United States. Every country's religious freedom in their constitution was borrowed from the U.S.'s. And ours sprung from this well in Providence where it was first established in 1636. We say that's the Bible's tree of life well where the tree of life is to be given back. Alan, how did you first get involved with cannabis? JCC summer camp, age 13. Okay. And that was in 1983. You've described yourself as, uh, you said, you, we may be Jesus freaks, but we're not flakes. Do a lot of people believe that you're a flake? Well, at first we had this really uphill battle about our sincerity or genuineness. People thought they, they'd hear about us and they say, oh, you found a loophole in religious freedom. I see what you're doing. But... It's practically legal where we live, and we qualify medicinally. We don't need to do this for safety's sake. And we, we've we been arrested dozens of times. We can't even keep count federal, state, and some states, you know, state of Pennsylvania gives us full recognition um, and protects us. Now the federal government is starting to. It's, you know, it's it's been a battle to show people that, no, we're not just doing this so we can smoke weed. We really believe this stuff, and we pray every day. And we're very sincere about this. So that was um, part of it. And then when people see us behaving so oddly relative to how most people do in the modern world, um, they might think we're crazy. But, you know, I've got a law degree, a fairly recent one from a prestigious university. She's got national, former national top security clearance holder and defense contractor, electrical engineer with a doctorate in divinity. Um, we're quite sober people despite our copious cannabis use. 
You said you've been arrested several times. Have you been charged? Oh, several dozen times. Several dozen times. Yes, um, everything from little petty slap on the wrist tickets from praying at the well, which is a national park, to um, more serious charges there because we kept going back despite the arrests. We were raided here last summer by the state attorney general uh, who actually attended one of the raids. He said we were growing unlawfully. We say we were completely within the Rhode Island statutes, but he says we were growing unlawfully and trying to push our advantage advantage as a church. So we had this serious felony technically still hanging over our heads. We expected dismissal soon, and we've sued the state, and we're expecting a million each in settlement. Um, it was quite it was quite severe in some regards. Alan, have you ever done jail time? Oh, I did six months in Georgia, and then, you know, wearing that stiff prison jumpsuit, picking up trash on the side of the road with a prison gang on, you know, in the Georgia summer heat, dodging uh, snake bites. But, yeah, I did some, I've done some time for growing. Now, you have said that cannabis should not be bought or sold. I'm confused by that statement. What do you mean? Well, to us, in the Bible, it's described as a Hebrew word, karem, which means it's consecrated to the Lord. So you can give it and share it and use it, but it's to be consumed, uh, including by livestock. But it's not to be bought or sold. It's sacred material, just like a communion wafer to the church or communion wine. And we understand that for people that don't believe, it can exist in a pre haram state, just like wine can be produced outside of the church and can be bought by the church and then consecrated and to be used for services. But you can't sell it once it's consecrated. Because we understand that some people depend on cannabis for their livelihood as they're producing this medicine that's saving people's lives miraculously, even atheists, Uh, we don't mean to turn over the apple cart, so to speak, even though we wish it could be uh, less artificially rare and artificially scarce. Um, We developed a model that within the U.S. tax code allows patients to get it for free while growers and chefs still get paid the normal amount to produce it, Um, and that's through what we call regenerative breaking. That's basically a a wealthy person creates an LLP that instead of donating to patients, puts together a company that gathers cannabis, cooks it up into medibles, and distributes it for free to patients and gets a tax write-off that due to the um, value added by cooking it and distributing it, actually gets him a write-off bigger than his initial investment as a charitable endeavor, and it's really worth it. And it's a nice way to give free medicine to people and still get that hard-working grower who's putting electricity and nutrients into it and a hard-working, talented, experienced chef paid, which they deserve. Alan, how many members does your church have? That's hard to say. Our biggest services tend to have no more than a couple dozen. And as far as hardcore members, I'd say it's six to eight. And two clergy, there's Reverend Dr. Ann Armstrong, who's the deaconess and leader, and I'm the canon, and I technically carry the title of Reverend Doctor, but I rarely use it. With such a a limited membership, do you feel as though you're fighting an uphill battle? Not at all. We really feel we've gotten quite a bit of success. Um, We got a communication through to the Attorney General, we're pretty certain, and we can document that we got it through to him causing him to make an address in July to a right-wing religious group indicating that his upcoming religious rights guidelines are going to expressly uh, protect us. We've gotten recommendation, uh, you know, express protection from the state of Pennsylvania to two enforcement agencies in the state of Pennsylvania. The state of Rhode Island is at a stalemate with us, laying off of us right now, even though we're on bail and have no rights against um search and seizure, leaving us be, um, we really feel that we're gaining a lot of steam. And what we're finding is that non-members or loose members at the periphery, when they're coming up with legal challenges in other states, are turning to us for help, and we're able to provide religious defenses in many cases, but also secular defenses with which we're familiar. We challenge the law uh, regarding the use of the M word. We We don't say that. We don't. Uh, everyone's allowed to use that word, just like the N word for black for black people. We don't judge other people for saying that, but you can't say it against me in a court of law because it's of racist, derogatory origin. It's a misspelled foreign slang word. It's not used in law of Mexico. Can't use it in court against me. 
which means you can't read the charts. So that's a secular defense anyone can use, and we help people with that. Uh, a high-profile case in Washington, D.C., big activist busted for outdoor smoking prayer there where you're not allowed to smoke outside. He threatens the religious defense with our help. They drop the charge. That was just this week. So we're really having an effect. We're really starting to make a lot more national news. Alan, I'm wondering what other um, religions feel about your particular church, the Healing Church. Oh, we take a beating with you know some of the people that we say were, are proverbially baptized in pickle juice. Um, <laughs> they, go, they go crazy. I'm um, giving the visual on that one. <laughs> <laughs> there are long-standing Catholics in the area constantly calling our anti, our notoriously anti cannabis bishop demanding that we be excommunicated from the local catholic diocese who we consider a sister church of ours and we go in wearing our cannabis regalia despite having had several scuffles with church security and they give us communion if we ask for it and they will not kick us out um my masonic lodge people have complained to them that i should be kicked out for conduct on becoming a mason and they technically ought to be suspending for, suspended for having a jailable charge pending against me. And I reported myself for it, and they will not accept the report. They won't kick me out. They just laugh. Um, so some churches get it. Some churches don't get it. There's always people within a church that just, they're so stunned by the fact that the basis of Christianity is cannabis that they can't handle it. Um, the Pope gets it. His uh, His family's ancestral coat of arms his last name is Borgoglio, and they have a 2000 year old coat of arms that had a grape cluster on it until right after he became pope the pope changed it to, to a cannabis bud he left a little sugar leaf on it but otherwise it's completely trimmed it's unmistakable it's a cannabis bud and the vatican has been changing their story about what it is and we caught them changing their story they're shushing him up what did they we, say? What did they say it was? Um, they say it's nard, and it is nard because nard means gummy perfume. There's spike nard, which is one kind of nard, and there's nard lily, which is another kind of nard. But nard just means gummy perfume. And there's one instance in the Bible where nard specifically refers to anointing spices, which include cannibalism or cannabis. So. It is technically nard, but they're trying to claim that it's spike nard, which it doesn't look like. And they're trying to claim that it was always nard when it was clearly white grapes before, and I have a record of them saying it was white grapes before, but now it's a cannabis flower. Well, when the Pope was visiting Washington, D.C. in fall of 2015, two years ago now, we marched from Providence, Rhode Island, 400 miles to Washington, D.C. to catch his attention, and we did catch his attention. The purpose of the march, as in the media, was to ask him about cannibalism in the anointing oil. Wasn't it cannabis? And we made quite a bit of media with this march. And when we got there, um, he went to put his new plaque on his new papal chair that was waiting for him at the Basilica, National Basilica. And the staff hid it around the back of the chair so the TV cameras couldn't see it. Nonetheless, the Pope gave his homily in Washington, D.C., his big speech. And lo and behold, it was all about anointing by foot pilgrims. Well, we were the only foot pilgrims there, or at least as far as the media reported. And we marched there to ask him about anointing. And he said, don't worry if they say you're crazy. Keep on marching and proclaim by anointing and anoint by proclaiming and just keep going. And he used the word anoint with 14 times greater frequency than we find it in the Bible where it's the theme. I mean, Jesus was the anointed one in the Bible. So... It is a theme of the Bible, but he used it like practically every other word. It was the theme of his speech when we marched there to ask him about that. So we say the Pope acknowledges us to the greatest degree that he can out loud, and that the Vatican is trying to shush him. Um, there are people within the Catholic Church who have attacked us repeatedly. We find that those people involved in using the Church as a money launderer to flush dirty money through it, um, heroin traffickers, and dirty law enforcement who interface with those money launderers hate us because they're the intimidation that keeps them in power as dirty police officers who sweat drug addicts and prostitutes and weak people um, 
if these people get cannabis, they say, fuck this, and they will just walk away from it all. It breaks their mind control. They hate cannabis, and they don't want people to know it's the tree of the life. In the Bible, the tree of life is depicted dozens of times, and there are 24 botanical depictions of it, all of which are common to cannabis, like it can be grown from cuttings, etc. So it is the tree of life, and people that behave like Satanists that are into this mind control and hurting other people, they hate cannabis. Alan, I'm wondering where you see the healing church going in the future. Well, people say we're crazy, but our deaconess, who is of that hereditary line described in the Bible, we consider ourselves as Hebrew Catholics the trunk of the faith, and Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox, and all the split-offs from them are branches. In that respect, the patriarchs of these churches, the various popes of you know Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Roman Catholic, African Orthodox, Ethiopian Orthodox, they're actually just stubs, and she outranks them. So if they are popes, then she's the pope. Um, the Bible did not say to abandon the hereditary class of healers slash leaders that existed before Jesus. He was of that line. He got that trait from his mother. Whether he had kids or not was irrelevant. As a male, he can't pass that trait. Only women can. Women after Jesus are depicted as having that trait in, in the Bible, including the woman who anointed him, Mary Magdalene. So that line continued and uh, continues to this day. And the head of the Hebrew Catholic Church, Ann Armstrong, who has that trait described in the Bible, is the Mom. She's the head of all the churches. If if the various branches of the church are a cannabis plant, she's the apical meristem, or top cola. What about some of the patients that you've helped, Alan? It's really Reverend Ann, but there was one particular miracle in which I was involved that I learned how to do it from Reverend Ann. We were in D.C. last spring um, on behalf of veterans who had gotten screwed out of their PTSD veterans who had gotten screwed out of their medical cannabis after Congress overwhelmingly voted to let them have it. Some procedural trick was used to deny it to them. And we had this protest in front of the White House that we were invited there to bless it, to give a little extra legal protection, as we'd done in the past with that same group. And a veteran there had a seizure right in front of us and in front of the Secret Service. It was that moment where everybody froze and nobody knew what to do. And Reverend Ann walks up and anoints the guy. He had scraped his face on the pavement when he fell and was bleeding. And as happens when people have seizures, he had urinated himself. So it's a wet spot on his trousers. Nothing to be, of no shame there. He's a veteran that served our country and took a beating. But that happens. And she anoints him and begins to pray. The Secret Service comes over and administers first aid. And they did a great job. But he's still seizing. But as she puts her hands out, there's this laying hands gesture and begins to pray, something happens with his endocannabinoids or his receptors, and she's flush with cannabis, so it's inductive through charisma or chrism, that's the anointing oil, charisma, she can do it inductively because she has the trait. The seizure just stops, and everybody's watching and sees it and feels it, including the Secret Service that really can't do anything for the guy but put him in the right position to not swallow his tongue. It just stops. The urine stain on his trousers is gone, and the bleeding wound on his face isn't bleeding, and it heals before our eyes in front of us. This dramatic acceleration, and everybody saw it. Well, when I was in jail last summer after the raid, I'm out there singing and praying. We're on the rec yard, and there's a guy in a rib jacket because his ribs are broken. He has a rare seizure where he's completely conscious and can speak, but he can't control his behavior. And he's grabbed another prisoner, a big beefy prisoner, by the shirt and can't let go. And he knows he's having a seizure and he's calling for help. And the other prisoner doesn't attack him. He sees what's happening and starts calling the COs for help. And they pull him off of the guy and he's got broken ribs, but they have to hold him down on the ground because he's having this seizure. And the COs feel terrible having to hold down this guy with broken ribs who's howling in pain and conscious through all of it. You can't do nothing for him. And everybody's standing there staring. I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, I better do that prayer thing like Reverend Ann. I didn't even have any anointing oil, but my body was just absolutely saturated with cannabis because I'd just been chucked in there. And 
you know, we just eat it constantly and inhale it. And we are that way. And I do the prayer thing and the seizure stops and everyone's watching. And the CEO's, it's on the camera. The camera's rolling because it's prison rec yard. And it just stops and everybody feels it and sees it. And I was in a prison dorm that had all the disabled guys with walkers and canes and crutches. So they'd all go down to the chow hall together via escalator, I mean, elevator rather than do the steps. And they're all bunched that way. And they're all lined up sitting against the wall because they can't walk around in rec yard. And they say, oh, do that to me. And they walk down the line of them doing the same thing, praying, invoking the Blessed Mother. And the first guy I do, he wriggles his toes and says, I haven't been able to wriggle my toes in five months. Actually, he could. He was just afraid to try from a time when he couldn't and when it hurt so bad, but scrunching himself down. But I did this cannabis-like prayer invoking the Blessed Mother, and it was like mom and a Band-Aid was there. You know how mom Band-Aid works better than a dad Band-Aid? That's placebic endocannabinoid healing. And all of a sudden, the inflammation goes away, which is partly placebic in the first place because it's afraid because of when it hurt. And the dude can wiggle his toes, and I went down the line, and these dudes are getting better. Now, as I went down the line, it got weaker and weaker. I burned it up. I was using endocannabinoids. I was burning cannabinoids in my fats, and I just wore it out. Had I had real cannabis there, lots of smoke, good metables, and actual cannabis oil, the noise oil for the prayer, it had been much stronger. And still, it was like as if miraculous. I mean, I want to be perfectly clear. If you're an atheist who's using cannabis as a medicine in a secular sense with no prayer and don't care about any and all that, think it's hoo-ha, the effects are still miraculous. If you've seen a kid with seizure disorder or somebody with bad ADD or Parkinson's or autism or Crohn's, it's a lifesaver, and it's a miracle. It's, it's enough to make believers out of some people all by itself, even in a perfectly atheist sense. If you boost that power with prayer, I mean, placebism works. We see prayer and lab studies hastening healing. If you boost cannabis' as awesome, miraculous, miraculous mechanical healing powers with placebism, it doesn't add to it. It multiplies off it. It's synergistic, and it's absolutely amazing. Alan, it's a fascinating story, and uh, we wish you well in the future. Is there anything you'd like to tell us in conclusion? If you know somebody that's just stuck against this, that that just cannot believe it, just take them to an old church from before 1915 and tell them to look up. It's in all the stained glass. It's in all the sculpture and fresco. It was right over our heads the whole time. Alan, thanks very much for doing this. We greatly appreciate it. Oh, God bless you for having me, and and thank you for all your work and all you do for patients. Alan, thank you so much. God bless. And if you want to help us out here at Cannabis Health Radio, make a small contribution. Go to our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and there's an icon for a donation. Make a donation. No donation is too small. No donation, of course, is too large. Help us out here at Cannabis Health Radio so we can continue bringing you these podcasts. Wherever you are in the world, thanks very much for listening. You've been listening to the Cannabis Health Radio podcast. Visit our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. 